Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'll just start because we were supposed to 10 minutes ago, and now everyone has finished their lunch, I hope. And um, we'll get into the after lunch um, position of having problems to focus, <laughs> but not with a panel like this, I hope. And um, that's what I'd like to start with, to introduce my um, panel members here today. Um, and to my left-hand side is Jeanette Hofmann. She's a political scientist here from Germany. She lives in Berlin. And she conducts research at the Social uh, Science Research Center here in Berlin, the WZB, for the Germans among you, on topics such as global governance, regulation of the internet, information society, and especially also in the last year's copyright issues. She's also a research associate at the Center of Anal Analysis of Risk and Regulation at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And what is also very interesting in this context here is that she's one of the founders of the project group Kulturraum Internet, Cultural Space Internet, which began to develop a social sciences and cultural studies approach um, to the internet in 1994, so a pretty long time ago. Um, which could be very interesting to draw on these uh, experiences today in our discussion. Next one is Sebastian Hauns. He is also a political scientist and currently works as a visiting professor for comparative politics at the University of Konstanz. His research interests are... No, 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 that was, that was correct. That was correct, actually. <laughs> but this is me, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, this is the community-based approach to sorting, <laughs> sorting name tags. I, I, I think we are at a, a good, uh, we uh, reached a good result right now. Um, so coming back, to, coming back to Sebastian, his research interests are social conflicts and political mobilization in the knowledge society, also political legitimacy, social networks and social movements. He has directed a research project on conflicts about intellectual property rights. So intellectual property is uh, a, a topic that will certainly play a role today in this discussion in Europe. And he's currently involved in the interdisciplinary research network Media of Collective Intelligence. And uh, recent publications of his focus on politics of intellectual property and also the politicization of intellectual property. Very, very uh, important topic right now. Next to him is Annalisa Pelisa. She's a media theorist and researcher in science and technology studies. She majored at uh, universities in many different countries in Europe and also the United States and China. And in her PhD years, she focused on how actor, actor network theory can revitalize studies on fleeting digital communities and online collaboration. She used a quality qualitative and quantitative uh, methods for this, for data collection and analysis, which we'll come back to a little later. And her present research interest investigates the new subjects of authority and novel geographies that are emerging from this redesign of information flows um, due to digitization of, of public data. You know, also a very, very interesting aspect of especially um, transnational and multinational uh, communities. And Last but not least is Benjamin Mako Hill. You uh, probably seen his or heard his keynote the other day. I uh, unfortunately missed it, I have to admit, um, which is very unfortunate because it can probably play a role in this discussion today, but uh, you will uh, come back to that probably yourself. He's a scholar, activist, and consultant working on, on issues of technology and society. Currently a researcher and PhD candidate in a joint program between uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology Sloan School of Management and the MIT Media Lab, and also a fellow at the Bergman Center for Internet and Society, and a research fellow at the MIT Center for Civic Media. His research focuses on sociological analysis of so social st structure in free culture and free software communities. 
So that's a lot of stuff I already told you, and it's probably very hard to remember, you know, when, I, um, uh, when someone throws all these uh, pieces of, of uh, biographies at you. But what I try to do is, in the first round, ask um, questions that directly relate to each of the participants' research topics. So um, we'll probably uh, have a chance to get to know um, each of the participants here at the panel uh, a little better um, when they tell you what, uh, how their research is connected to the, to the topic of today's discussion, with it, which is, of course, the norms and regulations of, um, of uh, communities. Some of them open communities, some of them more closed communities, and we're interested in finding out how they differ. And Sebastian, I would like to start with you because you've done research on the history of digital sharing cultures. Now, it's a very recent history, nevertheless, it is a history, and I would be interested, and I hope everyone else also, to find out why they developed in the first place. Is there any specific societal <laughs> factor or factors that were essential in their emergence? What can you tell us about that? That's actually really a hard, hard question, because I'm, I didn't do so much his uh, historic studies on, on um, digital sharing communities. I'm more interested in digital sharing communities because they, I think, are actually embedded in a wider set of conflicts um, in the knowledge society. And I mean, first of all, um, sharing is something that is that is not new. So, so we we live in societies, and and sharing is a really an, an established social practice. So we share in in in, in personal social settings, in, in in family with friends. So sharing is not something new. And I I, I mean I think I'm not telling you anything um, anything new um, here for this audience. But sharing even um, among strangers is not something new. So sharing is something that, that we, we know from, from hospitality, for example. So sharing between somebody that you actually do not know. So making some, something valuable um, from you. But as, as, as I said originally, my interest in or why I think these, um, um, thinking about sharing cultures is very interesting today and important today is because it is embedded in a wider set of social conflicts. And these social conflicts are directly related to the knowledge system. Soci knowledge society. So, and they they address issues of how knowledge is governed. So, how um, wh how the rules are established. Um, that that um, how knowledge is produced, how knowledge is distributed, and how knowledge is used. So, this is this, these kinds of conflicts has have not been there in the same way in the um, traditional industrial society. So, these are, are new social conflicts that are, that are um, popping up and developing um, in recent years. I, I wouldn't name an exact starting date when this happened because obviously these conflicts about knowledge um, have been there a long time, but they have been have become very very politically important rather recently. And I mean, one place, for example, where you could 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 look for these conflicts are and and see how important they have become, if you, for example, look at. Um, G8 meetings. Um, G8 meetings, I mean, these are the, 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 the meetings of, of the, the, the most powerful politicians um, of the world. And these are, yeah, largely symbolic meetings. And, um, but, but nevertheless, they, they, they set important policy agenda points. And if you look at when did actually intellectual property become an issue at G8 meetings, it's rather recent. So um, before 2000, intellectual property was not an issue on these meetings. But today, it is a very, very important point. It's even um, sometimes a point that is more important in terms of when does it come up at the, ag en at the agenda um, than, um, than um, equality, than um, resources, than um, even environmental, um, environmental policies. So it has become a very important political issue um, that is addressed in a variety of fora today, and not just fora that are specialized with these knowledge policies anymore, but fora that um, are um, that 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 um, address general policy issues. And so that's why, as a political scientist, I become interested in these sharing communities because they sh the sharing communities are part of this development, and um, they are they are kind of directly connected especially the digital sharing communities, are uh, directly connected to this wider set of conflicts because they also affect and address issues of, of um, digital, um, of intellectual property and digital civil, civil rights. Um, 
And what they do, these sharing um, cultures, is that they challenge the norms and values that we know so far um, and that we have that determine how knowledge is um, produced and how knowledge is appropriated, um, becomes property in um, the norms that govern today the um, knowledge creation and distribution um, and access to knowledge. So um, sharing is important because it is a, it, it um, offers an alternative to propertization, to um, knowledge becoming property. And that is, I think that is on a, on a meta level um, why these issues of sharing um, of Wikipedia as a, as a, as a tool that, we, that, that um, yeah, offers op opportunities for sharing, digital sharing communities um, is so important because they offer an alternative to the way that we are used to look at knowledge. Um, and these knowledge, these, 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 these conflicts, these are conflicts about access to medicines, access to knowledge, about software patents. Um, the pirate parties in Europe and Germany and Sweden especially, they are part of these conflict settings and creative commons <coughs> as, a, as, an, as, a, as an alternative way to govern um, the, the access to knowledge. All these, I these, um, these, these different settings in which um, conflicts about the governance of knowledge come up, they are somehow connected. And they address a number of important issues um, and of important new cleavages, of important new conflict lines in the knowledge society. And these conflict lines, um, they are first about what kind of, um, how, how do we um, innovate? What kind of innovation um, do we want to see? And how do we come to innovation? And I would say that there's basically two ways of innovation. So there's a, the traditional way of centralized, closed innovation, industrial innovation production. And the, the current system of intellectual property pretty much corresponds to this idea of centralized, closed innovation. So there's, there's large structures in which innovation is produced. And um, within these large structures, innovation is kind of enclosed and um, kept from um, the large majority to access. And this idea of innovation is challenged in these, um, these diverse conflicts about intellectual property rights and the governance of knowledge um, with an alternative model that I would say is an open knowledge and distributed knowledge model, where knowledge is no longer um, produced, or innovation is no longer produced in a centralized model, but in a, in a distributed mo no, uh, model, that's the model of um, of the um, free software um, community and where knowledge is made open and accessible to everybody. And these two con models um, uh, come in conflict. And obviously, some of the conflicts that we see today uh, have something to do with these, this more abstract um, idea of um, how do we um, think innovation should take place in society and um, from a political point of view, um, which structures should we have to, um, to, to foster specific ideas of innovation? Whose actors, which actors should we, should we um, encourage and which actors should we... Um, uh, uh, I, should I, was, I was just about to uh, interrupt you, but that's, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, you, have, you have already given us enough to talk f about for the next three hours, I think. But uh, let, let's come uh, a little, or let's try to come a little closer to um, the, the uh, connection between um, politics, uh, norms, and, and uh, um, the communities themselves. And I would like to ask Annalisa about that, because uh, she did a lot of research on um, open and closed communities and how they differ, you know, as in, in, in architecture, or as you called it, architecture of access. You, you wrote a paper on that, openness as an asset. And you started nodding um, while uh, Sebastian was, was talking, because I suppose you agree with a lot of what he said. Um, but could you elaborate a little on um, the the, the results of that, or not the results, but the, the structures of these um, communities that Sebastian was already referring to. Yes. Well, uh, I started my research um, from a very strong assumption that um, we're not sure uh, about what we talk about uh, what we talk about when you, we talk about communities, 
Um, because, you know, even uh, especially online communities are so fleeting objects of studies, you cannot uh, really um, frozen them. Um, so uh, many of, of the research in the 90s um, tried to uh, give a definition of community, online, of on online communities, um, postulating that some solidarity ties exist a priori. Um, what was what I was interested in was to try to find a way to recognize open communities without uh, thinking at solidarity ties as some kind of social substance in itself, um, because the, the, okay, the paradigm I come from, uh, which is a pronector theory, well, um, uh, it doesn't postulate uh, something social a priori, but looks looks at situated practices, a uh, situated um, yes, performances where the social emerges from uh, from other spheres, economic and political spheres. So the idea was, uh, can we um, find some ways to recognize open communities uh, looking at how they represent them themselves and not how, uh, uh, using ca categories that, that we as researchers can postulate. Um, so I uh, use some, uh, use analyze some uh, submissions to the Ars Electronica Festival, uh, where uh, spokespersons from communities all over the world um, represented themselves, and this was kind of um, innovative way for a researcher to uh, to make a step behind and ask people to represent themselves without uh, yes without uh, putting my own categories on what they do um, well uh, I analyzed their accounts on and I found some interesting uh, interest interest interesting points um, and also analyze how the code the software the architect the digital architecture um, constitute the boundaries of the community. Um, mixing these two variables, which I call the first one, the length of the chain of action. I mean, how do you represent your community? Do you use very deterministic explanations where uh, there are just a couple of uh, mediators where technologies are seen just as intermediaries? And okay, this is a, a theoretical distinction. I don't want to get too much into it, but um, Let's say that uh, a community spokesperson can represent the community itself as um, using deterministic explanations, like okay, access to technology empowers my community, which is a very very uh, short statement. I mean, short in the terms of how much actors are involved, or uh, they can uh, deploy in much full uh, depth how uh, the, the, the relationship between humans and technologies um, assemble the new community and how the community emerged. So this was the first uh, variable I took into consideration. Uh, how do you represent yourself? How in depth do you go in representing how your community emerged? And the second one uh, was more about um, how the architecture allows members and non-members to move into your community. The idea was uh, how does code allow the uh, outside, what some theoreticians call the constitutive outside, so mm -hmm. those who are outside the community to interact with the community. So how much are the, the boundaries that of the community permeable to the pe people outside the community itself and how can uh, they um, get into, yeah, interact with it. Uh, for example, if you define boundaries by making appeal to statistics or to, um, yeah, to modernist distinctions um, like uh, administrative uh, boundaries, well, that's probably, this is one of the results of my research, that it's probably that those communities are more likely to be closed uh, to external contributions. And those communities, uh, on the other side, who claim, who brings themselves into existence, who claim uh, to, to refer to other kind of boundaries, like for example tradition, 
or like for example um, cultural artifacts, cultural identity, uh, they are more likely to be open communities yeah. according to these variables. Could, could you give an example of uh, e either one? You know, yeah. a more open, more closed community um, depending on, on their architecture? On the architecture, uh, where I, I don't want to make names yeah. <laughs> right mm -hmm. now, but um, let's consider um, a Web 2.0 platform, a user-generated content platform. Mm -hmm. uh, how can people interact with it? Uh, do you need to present your ID, for example? There are some communities, I studied one of them in, in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to become a member, you have to provide your ID number, mm -hmm. which is a very different uh, political, um, uh, yes, policy from uh, communities which require you to be involved for some three or four or months or some years contributing to, 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 to producing contents. So uh, how you um, define the boundaries mm -hmm. to, to get people in into it mm -hmm. is a w uh, defines a political strategy mm -hmm. for that community. Okay, I, th I think we'll certainly come back to that la a little later on when we talk about concrete examples, probably even with Wikipedia. Um, but uh, first of all, uh, Benjamin, I, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you about your research because you've been looking at, especially in, in your recent, in the recent work you've done, um, at the motivation driving uh, collective action online. Um, and uh, I think everyone knows that you know, the story that, uh, especially with Wikipedia, people who make high quality contributions, they attract awards and status from peers. And, and that leads to um, more production of high quality contributions, you know, that, that virtuous uh, cycle that appears then. But um, in, in your research, you found that uh, many contributions to, to real public goods are actually made anonymously. So there seems to be some um, uh, break there in, the, in this motivational um, uh, theory that, that stands behind that. And no, not all individuals are, of course, equally uh, susceptible to these status-based awards or incentives. You know, s people, people differ very much in their motivations. But what does that tell us about the in incentives that we, that we can use, that we need to develop when we want to stimulate contributions to, um, to these uh, communities? Um. I mean, that, so, I mean, I've had lots of opportunities to talk to people at this conference already about some of my research, so I'll try to maybe be a little a little shorter in my response. Yeah, okay. Because um, uh, uh, I'd love to hear more from everybody else. I mean, so your, so, so, so would you, I mean, your question is sort of referring particularly to uh, a research project that I've worked on recently with Yochai Benkler at Harvard Law School and Aaron Shaw at uh, Berkeley Sociology. It's a collaboration with them. Um, what we've looked at is, um, in, in that particular study, what we've looked at is barn stars. And as you sort of suggested, when you look at, I don't know, people donating to traditional public goods, you see some people really do want the sort of reputation or status-based rewards. They want the building to be named after them, right, um, for their donation. And lots of other people will only donate if they can be anonymous in their donation, right? Like the large anonymous donations. And so the and so our idea was to sit, to sit, I mean this was sort of an empirical puzzle because a lot of people who are interested in encouraging uh, work in sort of free culture or free software communities have suggested that status plays a very important role in 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 terms of encouraging work. And so this is something that we've tried to sort of unpack uh, empirically in Wikipedia. What we find is that there are some people who are basically interested in taking that award and showing it off, you know, moving your barn star to your user page, and there are people who are not, who basically sort of know that they've received it and acknowledge it, but don't, don't do anything with it. And what you see is that there is, on average, a positive effect of receiving an award, but it differs very, in, but, it, but it differs between those sort of those those two subpopulations pretty significantly. People who are there are people who are interested in in the status based reward and interested in sort of using that award as a signal to other people. And for those people, you indeed see uh, sort of 
uh, increase in the amount of work. I don't know about the quality, but uh, uh, that's a that's another question. Um, uh, uh, but but uh, among people who are less interested in showing it off, you see no effect, or perhaps even in some situations a negative effect. Um, I, I'm generally interested in the. I mean, like to say that I study motivation is, I think, a little bit. Uh, that's not how I would characterize what I do. In part because I'm interested in looking at. I'm not interested in, in sort of getting inside people's heads for the most part. I'm 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 interested in building communities fundamentally and building new organizations, right? Um, we're helping people who are building communities sort of these. I'm interested in structural changes that designers of technological systems or the designers of wikis. I'm, I'm interested as someone who, you know, has started many Mickey, uh, wikis um, and many free software projects, something, things that, the things that I or others like me can do to sort of improve the, the, the success of peer production projects. And, uh, and, and, and understanding the dynamics of how the sort of, I mean, I, we think of it as, you know, as, as a designer, there's lots of sort of levers that we can use to, to sort of, help, you know, to sort of frame the way in which our communities work or the way in which people within our communities interact. And as the people who sort of run the sort of sites or the communities that are facilitating collaboration, we have a lot of power to sort of change the way that things work or the way that things don't work. And I'm interested in sort of, and, and I mean, this is just, I think, one example of, of, mm -hmm. of part of a, a you know, a, you know, broad, maybe even like sort of infinite types of possibilities, ways that we can help understand the dynamics as a way of sort of changing them and improving them to improve. Mm. To but, but, but if you do uh, consult someone on uh, building a community and, and they ask you, well, what is it exactly that we need to do? Uh, does that actually differ from uh, widely from um, one community to the other, depending on, on what you would like to achieve? Or is there anything that you found in your experience and your research that, um, that, that, that would always be a motivation or an incentive? Well, it depends. It's very easy to incentivize people. I mean, like, status or reputation is a very, like, like if you, if you want to reward people with, I mean, this is sort of like the, the gamification literature, right? Like, if you want to reward people with status, it, it, it'll work in the sense that you'll get, you'll get, you'll get what you're paying for. Um, but very often, you'll change the nature of the, you, through that process, you'll change the nature of that dynamics. Some other work, people who saw my talk a couple days ago saw this example of Scratch, this online community of kids basically remixing each other's projects. And, and in in that case, um, I've, I've another some other research where we've we've, they've, we've done this. We've introduced new status-based incentives to collaborate, mm -hmm. right? And sure, you see more collaboration. It's true, but you see a change. But, but 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 at the same time that you see more collaboration, you also see a change in the nature of collaboration. People ba basically do less work overall than they were doing before. Um, uh, uh, you have a net reduction in the amount of code being published on the platform, mm -hmm. um, and sure, you get more collaboration, but it's at a cost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, 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 so is the question, can you incentivize particular types of behavior? Sure. Can you do that in a way, can, can, but can we understand the nature of the way that those incentives work um, uh, to the point where we don't like, destroy our communities in the process? I mean, I think that that's, we're still on that part of the learning curve. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jeanette, let's, let's come back to the, um, uh, to the connection between communities and um, intellectual property, copyright especially, because that's, that's what you uh, worked on mainly in the last uh, couple of years. Now, um, the, um, one of your arguments is that there is, um, in, in the when you have strong copyright regulation, that usually means that we don't use our informational resources to the maximum um, effect. Um, the idea of uh, information being a public good, that is basically if you, um, if you commoditize that, uh, it becomes a problem because uh, you just don't use it to the effect that is possible. Now, we have a lot of communities that try to um, resist that idea of commoditization, uh, the free software community, the Wikipedia community. Now, um, uh, Sebastian uh, suggested that, or not suge suggested, but told us that uh, if we, for example, look at the G8 um, meetings, that intellectual property has come up on the agenda or has moved up on the agenda of importance. Now, um, can you probably let us know a little about, if, if you can, the, this, the, the uh, situation here? What comes first? Is it that these communities drive the discussion about intellectual property? Or is it that the, um, uh, the uh, commoditization of knowledge is driving that and that leads to more regulation and that in effect then um, probably leads to problems for communities themselves? Is there, is, is there anything like that? Or can you only say that you have these effects that go both ways? 
Um, I'm actually glad that you come back to Sebastian's uh, introductory remarks because I thought they're really worth uh, discussing um, a while more. Um, I liked it very much the way uh, Sebastian phrased this. Uh, I mean, if you want his hypothesis is that the conflicts that were typical for industri uh, industrial society are now transformed into conflicts that will shape uh, the, the structure, the design, the architecture of the information society. It's kind of a paradigmatic conflict about access and use of various, uh, to knowledge. I think that is really, really good and it deserves being worked upon also in terms of empirical proje uh, projects. What I'm not so sure about is what you uh, then said afterwards about two models of innovation. And now I'm coming back to your question. I would think that it's probably not so much a binary situation as a, a wild mixture because um, my my thought is that all this war about copyright that we have right now is mainly one on the discourse level, but that in practice, copyright is probably not that important as we have come to believe it is. Not even for uh, people who sort of depend on copyright. Very often in practice, people share because um, as, as, as uh, um, econo uh, in economics that has been described many times, um, protecting knowledge in a way that uh, we guarantee exclusive use leads to underutilization. We don't uh, use knowledge enough if uh, we make it exclusionary. And people who, pro uh, who produce sort of uh, professionally um, protected knowledge still depend on other people's knowledge. The whole idea about sharing is not just normative, it's also out of sheer need. You depend on other people's knowledge. And the same, of course, is true for industries that <coughs> produce knowledge uh, in a professional way. They have to collaborate all the time. They need to set standards. They need to produce software that is interoperable. So they need to communicate about what they're doing or what they plan to do all the time. So what I'm really curious about right now is what practical role does intellectual property rights actually play in governing the production and the use of knowledge? I think we don't know enough about that because we discuss it always in this very antagonistic manner that prevents us from really looking in detail at what it actually means having those laws versus not applying those laws. Do they actually protect markets or products or ideas or information we really don't know enough about that. And my assumption would be that probably this law is, and this discourse as well, is much too broad and not subtle enough to see the differences. Perhaps at various stages of knowledge or uh, production or in various industries, we don't need it at all. Or just in a different way. There's also, of course, a way of applying it that reinterprets the meaning of it all the time. So we don't know enough about that. And I guess if we did more empirical research, we could probably learn quite a lot. Um, Benjamin, I would, I would like to uh, come to you directly um, after what Janet said, because you've been very active in uh, different communities, free software, um, Wikipedia. Um, so so um, especially, you know, when, when you look at free software, for example, then you have the situation, and with, Wiki with the Creative Commons licenses and other licenses, it's similar, that uh, on, on the one hand, they depend on a uh, um, on a existing copyright regime, but at the same time, they try to um, do something different with it to uh, create a new idea of how uh, information can be produced, distributed, and shared. Now, um, when we look at the values of people who are active in these um, in these communities, uh, wha what is your reaction? I mean, I, that could probably be only anecdotal. I don't know whether you have done any research on that. I mean, I, I haven't mm -hmm. done research on mm -hmm. on this 
particular topic. I mean, I've done uh, not very directly. I mean, there's th there is actually a lot of empirical research on the uh, effect and usefulness of uh, of intellectual property rights. Right? You're right that the debate is had it like like it doesn't seem to care very much about what the empirical reality is. Um, but 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 that's not to say that people haven't been doing this research in in terms of patents. There's been good research going on since the since since the early 1970s. Um, um, uh, patents are very well studied. Um, uh, and and I mean like and, and it's an interesting question, right? Because like the 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 it's it's hard to say. Um, you know, do does you know what is the effect, positive or negative, intellectual property without sort of doing the experiment and sort of like turning it off in certain places. Some people have looked for uh, examples of places where th these experiments have happened. Mm -hmm. um, they've looked at pre-patent eras um, and uh, like or, or places where patent systems were taken away for periods of time, like in the 19th century. Petra Moser's done some good work on this. There's been a long series of research where they've gone around to people who created important innovations and said, "Would you have created this innovation if you had no patent?" And the answer um, in all Almost all industries has been yes, of course I would do it. Um, the exceptions being chemicals and uh, uh, like plastics um, and pharmaceuticals. Um, um, so there's a few areas where the answer is no, I would not have done it. But the reality is we actually understand quite a lot about the empirics in uh, about about the empirics of uh, uh, we, we have a lot of empirical data about the usefulness or the limits of intellectual property more broadly. Um, it's just that people on sort of I mean, some ha half of the debate is uninterested in looking to those empirics because they don't like the answers, and the other half is uninterested in looking at them because because they believe that the debate is not going to be won on those terms. Um, so, right. so. No, no, but my my question was also uh, targeting the, the the values inside the communities themselves and how, for example, when Jeanette suggests that uh, we are probably giving too much importance to this to this debate at all. Now, uh, what is your reaction and everyone else's reaction to that? When you look at the communities, do they care at all? That, that's what I was trying to find out when I used the free software example that, you know, I if you want to have the GPL, you need a copyright system, right? Um, probably you could do it differently if we just didn't have the copyright system, but that would be, you know, rather useless to, to think about. So, but the values in inside the communities themselves, free software developers, d are they interested in that in general? Are it only the people who are um, active in the free software movement? There's, there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of people in the free software community and they have a lot of, of course. and they have, they have a lot of different positions mm -hmm. on this. Um, the, I mean, like the official position, um, to the extent that there is a, a, an, an official position, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, that, is that copyleft is so copyleft in the GPL and so on and so forth. The idea of using copyright to sort of uh, uh, sort of limit the damage done by copyright mm -hmm. um, is uh, you know the 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 best we can do given the current system, mm -hmm. and that uh, and, and I mean I, I, personally I agree with that as well. I mean I think that I think that we lose a lot more to copyright than we gain through copyleft. The GPL is great, um, uh, copyleft licensing is great, but like uh, the the you know. We we as sort of a culture like like where where our sort of the cultural works which are most important to us are uh, many of them are mm -hmm. locked up in ways that we can't get access to it. I mean, uh, th there's there's no way that I mean, yeah, is it, does it have some tactical benefits? Sure, um, but but on balance, do we gain more from copyleft than we lose from copyright? I don't, I don't see mm -hmm. I don't see this, oh, there's any way you can say that that would be the case. Okay. Uh, Annalisa, w w what is your experience when you looked at the communities? The, as I said, the, the values, the motivations, but what, what role does that play? I mean, the, the debate about uh, in enclosure of, of knowledge, the debate about copyright, intellectual property in general. Well, I would say it depends very much on the goals of a community. Of course, the free software community is a very um, skilled community and very sensitive co to copyright. Uh, issues, but um, let's think, for example, to people who gather online to get a sense of uh, intimacy, and I'm referring to social networking sites. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I do think there there, there are no um, much issues about, no many issues about copyrights there, mm -hmm. and not even about privacy. Um, uh, it, it really depends a lot on the, the, the goals of the community. Another example could be cultural and artistic communities. Of course, uh, well, uh, with artists, it's more similar to free software uh, communities because uh, there is this kind of um, anarchic solidarity, so kind of uh, 
the individuals who sustain each other in their projects, so they create networks. Um, uh, they are most sensitive to how their works are used. Uh, so it, it really depends uh, on, on the goals of the community. And I repeat, uh, we cannot think uh, at a, a single uh, way of being communitarian online. Mm -hmm. so but would you be able to comment uh, specifically on communities that are engaged in, in uh, let's call it knowledge production, you know, something like Wikipedia? So they have a very specific goal. It's not a social networking site. I mean, there could be <laughs> there's certainly some social networking in the in the commenting section and in the discussion. But uh, aside from that, that's not the goal of Wikipedia, uh, for example. Now they they are interested in in creating information, creating knowledge, and making this freely available to everyone. Uh, would you be able to say something about their um, the, the situation there? How much um, how much value people put on the discussion about these issues? Uh, is it is it influencing that discussion at all, or would you would you probably say that well, you know, they do what they do, and uh, of course they have to care about the regulation and the norms, but they do it as uh, little as possible because they just want to do what they you know what they're interested in. Okay. Um, well, I haven't researched extensively on Wikipedia, so I don't want to mm -hmm. um, give answers that are n don't pertain to me. But uh, what I see in Wikipedia I is a tremendous effort to translate the kind of geek culture uh, from the regions, let's say, to into the the, 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 the Enlightenment broader framework mm -hmm. of universal knowledge. Uh, this is really. Uh, astonishing to me because uh, th th they're really um, uh, yeah it's it's really a tremendous effort and I uh, if we look at Wik Wikipedia under this um, definition let's say um, well you, you can easily see that um, of course, cop uh, copyright issues, they're very sensitive to copyright issues and to this idea of knowledge that should be open as accessible to everybody, um, which comes from the, really from a modernist idea of uh, the enlightenment. But still, what I'm interested in is how do they um, build their boundaries? Mm -hmm. um, because even in the universal model uh, of knowledge in production and distribution, there are boundaries. Of course, uh, uh, in the Enlightenment, the boundaries were the, the national boundaries. Of course, yeah, in France, the, okay, I don't want to talk about, mm, about that very much, but um, we don't have geographical boundaries anymore in, in online. So I'm very interested in looking at how um, these boundaries are reconstructed in a community like Wikipedia, which tries to bring the geek culture mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. uh, an older framework. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wh which brings us back probably, Sebastian, to uh, regulation in general, because what Annalisa just said is, is, is very interesting when we come to um, communities that, that have no national boundaries, but at the same time, um, norms and regulations are still very national. At least I would I would argue. You know, even though we have international systems, again, you know, a good example would be copyright, but or also patent system uh, things like that. Uh, probably or not probably, but for example, we don't have uh, s uh, so much of an internationalized or multinational uh, system of of uh, ideas about privacy. You know, which is different. Um, but uh, wh what does that mean for communities? when you look at this kind of, first of all, the non-national communities that we have, the, the multinational, international communities, and at the same time, the still very national regulation. I think what, what we see is actually that we, that there's a tendency to, um, to universalize and to internationalize these, these, these norms and rules. Yeah. And that is, that is, that yeah. is an important element um, why these conflicts have become um, so politicized and um, have, have grown in size and grown in importance. So um, it may be true that yes, um, we do not have a worldwide patent, but we do have the simil sim similar rules for all countries basically all, all WTO um, members um, that, that governs the length of a patent, um, for which I issues patent, or in which areas patents have to be granted, and so on. And it's basically the same for copyright, too. So we do have now a global system that governs the creation and, and, and privatization of knowledge. And, and so all these conflicts, uh, they kind of 
develop within this global system. And I think, yes, it is important to look for communities and it's important to look, look, look for their, their local practices. And I completely agree with you that, yes, there are many, many practices that kind of subvert um, the, 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 the system, um, how it should work. Um, but nevertheless, um, the interesting thing is, um, when do these, these, these subversive um, practices really question the, um, the, the existing systems and under which conditions and when do they come together? And sure, I mean, even if we talk about industrial society, there was, there was agrarian practices, there was all kind of small trade practices within the industrial societies and the, all this existed um, kind of not really, not really strongly la related to the change in the, in, the, in, the, in the dominant norm of industrial production. And we do see the same thing here today, I think. So we, we do have all kinds of practices that are, have been traditional. So all kinds of sharing practices have been traditional and have been used and, and will, um, will also be continue to be used. But nevertheless, um, there, is, um, the, uh, there, there is a conflict. And, and we do see, um, I mean, I, I could ask the other way around. If, this, if, these, if we do see all these kinds of, of, of subversive practices and, and if intellectual property rights were not so important for most, for most even economic players, why would it then be such an important political issue? Mm -hmm. So obviously, um, this, um, this, this, this plays a role. And, and, it's, and um, I mean, um, we, can, we should try to answer and look for these other practices and how are, how do the, are they used. But we also should try to um, explain and, and find, find, find a framework that explains us why does something become the hegemonic discourse? Yeah. And why does it structure on a, on a broader um, issue um, how we think about knowledge creation, sharing, um, and so on in the digital mm -hmm. realm. I, I would like to hear Jeanette on this, but first of all, I'd like to also tell you that uh, we would be very happy if you had uh, questions or statements that uh, would probably bring our discussion here further. So if you have anything, please let me know by holding up your hand and I'll try to see you. It's not easy because the lights are very bright, but uh, there are not so many people here. So I'll uh, certainly be able to um, find out if you have any contributions to the discussion. So just please let me know. Um, but, uh, Jeanette, I mean, uh, I could argue that, well, you know, subversion, of course, that's one part, but uh, the, 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 the fact, or at least the thesis, that we live in, in a uh, state of capitalism that's the cognitive capitalism that makes, um, that, that rests uh, on the idea that more and more knowledge, as we uh, said before, becomes commoditized and, and part of the, um, of the system of uh, basically making money in a society. Um, is a one of the main reasons why we have these conflicts and not so much the, the subversion that probably comes afterwards. The, I'm, I'm just uh, using that as a thesis. You know, what, what, what would you answer to that? Is it the communities that try to subvert this? Is a file sharing, is file sharing, can you, can you even talk about a community that engages in file sharing? Or do we just talk, you know, sometimes people say um, file sharing community, in my opinion, there we don't have a community there. We have people engaging in, in uh, practices, but this is not the same as having a community, right? Um. I find that, diff I mean, these are different, different questions, obviously. Um, First, let's come back to the subversive thing. I, that I, I said that in response to Sebastian's idea that there is a sort of binary structure was, uh, in terms of innovation, that there's closed and open innovation and that this is part of the paradigmatic conflict. And I thought in practice we find probably many shades in between where people do share even if they are involved in professionally producing protected uh, products or knowledge or whatever. And um, part of these practices might be subversive. But still, I think we should not forget that the conflict is not only between those who uh, build, I mean, who benefit from propertization and those 
who share, but that it's also between industries. Some industries uh, really depend on strong I, um, uh, intellectual property rights, and other industries benefit very much from people sharing, not least ISPs. Um, sort of, there is not uh, one line sort of uh, users versus industry, and part of this conflict. And I think the, the public discourse, or this war on intellectual property rights, doesn't properly reflect uh, the various factions involved in this, uh, this conflict. And I can see that even uh, the software industry, sometimes people tell you that, that they get tired of these permanent um, uh, lawsuits that they have against each other, cooperating on one level and suing each other on, the other, uh, on another level. I mean, the same companies, the same people. This is a bit absurd, and it's a waste of resources, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it is really important that we contribute more to agenda setting and get out of this antagonistic debate and try to get the uh, sort of... Um, develop a more rich discourse that shows also the dilemmas involved in uh, all this discussion. Because, um, as you pointed out, the pharmaceutical uh, industry, but also the film industry, to some degree, depends on property rights for their business models. If you develop um, a new uh, pharmaceutical means, and it needs years of testing to get it uh, uh, to get it uh, licensed at all, and that costs you between twenty and thirty uh, millions of uh, dollars or euros uh, as the least. Then you won't do that without some. Uh, uh, pr protection of a market. That seems pretty obvious to me. But this is something that is completely different from other uh, lines of industry. I mean, uh, I, I, I think that, that I mean, I, I, I approach these questions from a more principled perspective. I say, no, I mean, really, I say, like, no, like, drugs which are going to save people's lives, people need access to them. Like, right, uh, I don't think that, that, that we should say that, that um, these people need to die because uh, if they didn't do it, they wouldn't be able to know. I mean, this, this is, in effect, what pharmaceutical companies who are insisting on patent protection for their drugs want, or they want subsidies um, f you know, f for their profits. We are making a risk by investing in the, pr the production of this product. There's an alternative, which is we can say that, that this information is broadly important and access is essential, that, that we're going to take a principled position, p p position that people need access to information because it's important to, in the case of a drug, potentially life. Um, or at least quality of living, and in the pr and, 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 and in the position of other types of, Im uh, of information, it could be just sort of experience or understanding of the world, but it's important that people be able to share. And now we can say, all right, how can we produce this good in ways that would, that would make it accessible, right? And, p and people have done this in the, in, in the case of drugs, right? There's some very interesting work by um, the uh, Knowledge Ecology International, um, Jamie Love and that group on the production of um, prize-based incentives for the production of essential medicines. If we start from the position of what are the essential sort of freedoms or what are the important principles that we want to work from. We can work from there and then say, okay, great, how might we create a reference work that is freely available and that everyone can use. And we can do things in ways that maybe we couldn't imagine before. Um, and you're right, that is a more antagonistic role, to, um, position towards, the, towards traditional um, content industries. And I'm perfectly happy to take that antagonistic role. <laughs> I meant uh, that for the discourse as we have it right now, that is perhaps uh, the one that we have particularly in Germany between users and uh, creators, that we need to get out of that because it simplifies matters to a degree where you can't really reflect uh, on uh, on the sort of diversity of issues at play here. I, I have no problems discussing completely different models of setting up the health system, especially in the US, you are experts on that, I suppose. Um, I think there is nothing wrong with sort of completely subsidizing the production uh, uh, of of pharmaceutical products. I'm fine with that. I'm just saying that as it's right now, it would create damage to an industry more than it would do to other industries, probably, if there was no, protec no protection, because we have set very high requirements in terms of testing to them. 
um, the whole permission process pharmaceutical uh, products is that high that if you don't give them some protection for some time uh, they won't produce it I do believe that argument for that industry that's all what I wanted to say but I'm not saying uh, that I'm an advocate of that kind of industry model well, well, uh, do you have a comment on that Annalisa yeah, yeah? okay please go ahead um, opportunity to exemplify was a, what, uh, why we can't postulate community from the beginning. And I, I don't want to talk about communities, but I prefer to talk about techno-social assemblages. So um, the, the controversy about pharmaceutical products, for example, if you, um, uh, it's about setting the boundaries again, because do you include the person who needs the, the, the drugs into that techno-social assemblage? Yes. If not, so it's, uh, it's okay that, um, it means that uh, you have to pay for the, for the drugs, but if you include in that assemblage people who need that drugs, so you have to complete re-engineer that techno-social assemblage. I don't know how, uh, maybe with more uh, subsidi subsidies are a way to re-engineer uh, the market, but that's the point. You cannot have um, a community or a an assemblage from the beginning, you, we have to start thinking at re-engineering the mm -hmm. models that mm -hmm. we have today. Mm -hmm. Wh which is probably what the free software movement did, right? I mean, they, they basically, if you, if you want to frame it that way, you could say that they re-engineered the model of uh, production of software because they said, you know, we as um, uh, programmers, we also need to use other people's, other programmers' work, so we need to find a way um, to ma make that possible. Now, uh, uh, please uh, uh, comment on that, Benjamin, but also... The, the the question of y that um, or not the question but the idea of, of uh, subversion again is that does that play a a role in that um, community is that for example also a motivation for people in that com in that community I don't know whether you I can say I something I completely understand what you mean by the role of subversion um, of, of the existing system you know that uh, is it is it a, a pragmatic approach I would call subversion a political approach and the more pragmatic approach would be uh, you know, if I want to, if I want to code uh, good stuff, I need access to other good so, code. So. so there are plenty of people who've come to the free software movement over the last 25 years um, who have come because they're not p be, be for, for pragmatic, purely pragmatic reasons. There's mm -hmm. a large number of people in the free software community who reflect that. But the free software movement started with a statement that software should be free. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the initial documents that were published around free software, you see people basically assuming that programmers will at the very least make le less money. And that perhaps people will have to write software in their spare time because we don't know how to produce it, right? Mm -hmm. The idea was this is an the, the, the ability to control one's technology is an essential freedom. To the extent that technology sort of control, uh, you know, helps sort of frame uh, or sort of, you know, explicitly sort of determine in some senses the, uh, the, the nature of how we experience the world and each other, the control over that technology is an important sort of, for political reasons, a very important right that people should have right, mm -hmm. so that's where it started, and the idea was is that the, 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 the people's assumption was is that this was an impractical sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, what happened is is that when people sort of insisted on doing it and were using software that was not better and working together on things that was sort of in no ways sort of superior or, or um, uh, to the proprietary alternatives, that eventually enough people worked on that that they realized that there were some sort of positive benefits to working openly and that uh, they were able to attract a lot of people to the sort of you know, to to the communities that were less motivated by the sort of the these these high principles that people started out with, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean, it, this has certainly happened. They're 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 welcome. They in turn have contributed a lot, right? There's a lot of big companies who've contributed a lot mm -hmm. to the production of free software over the last um, 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but 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 the movement started very explicitly because people yeah. were willing to. Uh, with the assumption that people were willing to give things up because they thought that this was a um, thought, thought you know thought this would be a better world. Right. What 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 is your assessment now when we talk about this reframing of a discussion? Because what certainly was a major success, except from you know, a, or a, in addition to the to the code that was released, to the great programs that were released, uh, it was certainly a success that um, there is a model now that you can point to and, uh, and, and say, you know, 
look at this, it does work, even though even the people who started it probably didn't all believe in it at the beginning. Now it does work in, in, being a, in offering a alternative model of, uh, of, of production of software in that case that was also used as a role model for others. Uh, well, I mean, if pe the people who saw my talk a couple of days ago, you, you realize that I don't realize that it, I don't believe that it works all the time um, yeah. or even very often. Uh, uh, I think that the, the reality is, is that the most of the time it doesn't really work very well at all, not in the sense that it becomes very sort of collaborative. I think that the only you know, inherent benefit of free software is the principles. I think that the only inherent benefit of Wikipedia or free culture is the fact that it is 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 the fact that it allows people to sort of transcend their roles as consumers of culture. And I think that that's important an important enough issue that 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 it's worth insisting on it and it's worth finding how to produce these things better and more effectively and to engage more people in the process. Um, that's a that's a principled position that I am taking, which is implying uh, a set of uh, empirical research and sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, experimentation and learning mm -hmm. uh, within our communities um, with the goal of, of building better stuff, with the goal of spreading a, a certain set of important freedoms and rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. So s still no questions or comments? Ah, there. Okay. Please. Do we have a microphone or do we need to use the one that we have in front here? I'm... Not quite sure. Oh, j just just speak loudly and then we'll. Okay. Are you are you uh, posing that question to uh, to everyone on the on the panel or someone in specifically? Whoever wants to uh, react to that. So so the question is, um, if if not everyone understood what the question was, um, in terms of you know um, informational goods needing to be exclusive to exclude others from um, using them, um, to be able to um, to sell them. And if, this, uh, if the challenge to that notion uh, actually is a uh, challenge to the market eco economy in general. Uh, very quick answer to that, um, yes. Um, <laughs> so just to elaborate, Please elaborate. <laughs> to elaborate a, little <laughs> a little bit on that. Um, yes, we do um, um, question the, um, the principle of the market economy. At least we, we, we question that everything should be propertized. And that is that is an important element. So that and and it, as you know, I mean, the, the 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 mechanism of the market economy is that more and more areas of our life become propertized and property, and it, they become propertized because um, the the universal media of exchange in the market economy and capitalist system is money, and um, money can only handle propertized stuff. So as long as it's not propertized, you cannot pay for it. Um, and I think yes, the, the, this, this this movement that that or the the, the various movement and, and initiatives that that question this principle of privatization of knowledge are actually questioning this central principle. And I have no answer to what kind of alternative model um, we should expect. But yes, they do question a central mechanism, and therefore it is also a very very important political conflict. Okay, Jeanette, you would also like to answer um, that question or I give, think give a comment? Um, I wanted to say that I find this a very clever question and that I've been asking this myself since I work on this area. And um, I wouldn't be able uh, to come up with a simple yes. I would say economies should be about efficiently allocating goods. And we need to find out whether 
the market is an efficient means of allocating goods, yes or no. And we know that for information goods, it's often absolutely non-efficient. Um, it doesn't even, it does not only recover the costs of producing a good, but it creates monopolies. And that is, as we know, not really good because prices are high and use is much lower than it should be. So I think we can give rather um, uh, simple answers for specific areas such as academic uh, goods, you know, articles, books, uh, whatever, studies. Since they are uh, produced with uh, tax money, they should clearly be free accessible. And since a lot of pharmaceutical products also are heavily subsidized, one could say, yes, they should be freely available, especially since they are so vital for many people's life. But I'm not so sure about other areas. For example, what we've been discussing uh, the re in the recent years, uh, subscription models for music, for example, that would be a sort of semi solution, half uh, accessible because everybody pays a flat fee and gets everything and still exclusive because you have to pay something. But what I would find very important is that we find solutions that accommodate the way we actually approach and use information goods. They are experience based. Only once you've uh, used them once do you know what they are actually worth to you. Uh, so you want to be able to browse as you browse TV channels. This I find very essential and that we don't exclude people. And if it means with say a 10 euro fee per month, we would get most people on board that would be acceptable for me. So I wouldn't rule out, I try to take really in a pragmatic approach and uh, sort of take into account solutions that would still uh, use market-based mechanisms or at least rule them not not entirely out. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you would like to answer to that? No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Please, go ahead. I'd really like your response to this because I think I agree with your answer, but it's really important to me to separate two different types of discussion. I think one discussion is about a sort of goal for people that public, publicly produced goods are actually accessible to the public and a discussion about indeed certain industries having a more efficient model when they use uh, open source principles uh, and use freedom. But I think these are two very different discussions and, and your, in your uh, response they were But I think it's also two completely different uh, uh, things that are happening in, in society, uh, both about mm -hmm. these issues of openness. I mean, uh, maybe to, to make the, my, my quick answer, yes, a bit more complicated. Uh, actually, we do see in society already many, many instances where um, the distribution of goods and the production of goods and all kinds of social real, um, rules do not function according to market economy pr principles. And this is luckily so. Um, and I, th that's just what I say. And I, I, as, um, the interesting thing is now that um, we, we see this discussion on the level of, um, of, of principles of industry, of, 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 a, of an important um, leading industry sector and how their, um, their, their um, principles of production um, should be assessed. Um, and obviously, I mean, we have mechanisms in the um, se uh, realm of social care, um, social services, um, and so on, that do not function as market economies. And they only function because they do not function as market economies. And that's the, I mean, that's the, the interesting thing about market economies. Obviously, they can persist and exist um, even though they, um, th there's lots of contradictions in them. Annalisa, please. You said, bring to, brought to my mind um, an issue which is not very often addressed when we uh, when we talk about uh, copyright and free knowledge, which is the issue of labor. I mean, um, today it persists an endemic lack of business models that can redistribute 
the, the, the value which is produced online. So it's very different to think about uh, labor which has to be paid, like for example artistic labor, um, and uh, making profits. Uh, uh, so I do think this is a dimension which has to be reconsidered uh, uh, together with that of consumption. It, I mean, let, let, I, you know, I'm uh, trying to think about all the time um, the, um, about the nexus of what we're talking here um, or what we're discussing here in terms of intellectual property issues on the one hand and, and the community issue on the other hand, which seems to you know, fall apart, but at the same time it's, it, it, um, it's closely connected depending, of course, on the community we're talking about. If we look at free software, if we look at um, um, open content communities, if we look at Wikipedia, there is a direct uh, connection, of course, between the idea of um, copyright uh, or intellectual property on the one hand, a challenge probably to that on the other hand, um, um, and, and the, the things or the, the knowledge that these communities are trying to produce. And what I'm trying to make sense of is um, what, how can we phrase that connection? How can we put our finger on that connection? Is it really important in these um, communities? Um, this issue of intellectual property or, you know, as I asked before, you know, when we're talking about market economy and the efficiency of that, these are all very, very big questions. What kind of role do they play in these communities? Um, that is also what I'm interested in, especially, you know, we're at the Wikipedia Academy here. So, so this is about uh, uh, um, Wikipedia, the, the motivations, the incentives that people have to work in Wikipedia. What kind of role does it play there? Of course, now you could all say, well, we don't really know, you know, because we haven't looked at that closely. We haven't asked people for motivations, but everyone has, I think, has at least a sentiment about that or some, uh, as I um, said, anecdotal uh, evidence in, in quotation marks. Where is that nexus? Would you, uh, I mean Benjamin? So, so, so my intuition is that our community, I mean like, and this is just my intuition, my intuition is that our community spend way too much time worrying and thinking about intellectual. Way too much? Time T thinking about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. implementing, enforcing, um, creating licenses. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that, that, the, that, that we elevate the people who produce licenses. I mean like, uh, Creative, you know, like like when Creative Commons launched, they called they called the GPL the Constitution of the Free Software Movement, right? Mm -hmm. And it's wrong. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. The Free Software Movement, w the Constitution of the Free Software Movement, is the free software definition, which says there are four essential freedoms. There's a set of principles, right? Mm -hmm. um, people spend a lot of time thinking about licenses, but the reality is is that free culture communities, if you look at the way they mostly operate, um, uh, at least in terms of the people who are producing content, um, it's basically just a sort of intellectual property free zone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that the 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 extent to which people are worrying about uh, these issues are just a sort of distraction um, yeah. for the most part. Um, which is not to say that they don't play important roles, right? Um, the, fact that, the fact that Wikimedia content is all very consistently licensed and that Wikimedians do a better job of enforcing copyright within their projects than any copyright <laughs> enforcement agency on earth um, uh, means that, I mean, there are upsides to this. Um, um, it means we have a lot less content in the encyclopedia, that's sure, um, for sure. But it also means that that content can move, uh, can be printed by other people, can be reused easily that people don't, people sort of uh, uh, can assume that the work will be able to be um, effectively used. That said, like, uh, um, um, I mean, you know, I, I understand that that's an important role and I respect the people who work hard on that. Mm -hmm. I don't do it myself. Um, and I think that uh, um, just because I find it a little depressing um, uh, personally, um, but, but I think that it, but I think that, that, uh, that, that, I mean, I, I think our communities could, uh, uh, we treat it with a little more respect and importance than I think it necessarily deserves. I don't think it's an important part of, like, okay. well, well, let's, in the community. Yeah, let's, let's, let's make that this the last round of our discussion, uh, because I think we, we have come to a, um, a point that, that is, first of all, very, very interesting. Secondly, might be, um, uh, you, you might have very, very different uh, outlooks on that, on that issue. So I would like to ask uh, each one of you, Benjamin, you already answered that question, so please, Annalisa and the others. About this 
the nexus, you know, what and, and what Benjamin said that he he thinks that you know the um, inter intellectual property copyright issues are um, more or less a distraction when when it comes to communities and uh, I mean the free community free uh, content communities and what they're producing. Well, uh, I think I already answered before. Uh, um, still, it it depends a lot on 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 the type type of communities. Um, yeah, we're not talking about dating GDL. communities. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, uh, uh, different from him, I'm not so much into mm -hmm. a single uh, mm -hmm. community, so uh, my experience with communities directly involved com comes from the early 2000s with the Telestreet movement, and that was, uh, well, there, yeah, the, the mm, copyright issues were not at all. Uh, taking into consideration that moment mm -hmm. um, because we had to say something about what was going on in Italy in that case. Uh, you probably heard about the Telestreet movement, m m micro broadcasting television movement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, we started broadcasting um, in a very low range in the neighborhood, one or two neighborhoods. Um, uh, in at the early, uh, at the beginning, mm -hmm. in early 2000s, uh, the, the we didn't have any issue about copyright. Uh, but I do think today the situation is very, very different. And again, um, we should really uh, think about uh, models of redistributing the value which is produced online. I'm not thinking about copyright strictly. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about that, but I thinking that uh, you know, intermediaries, aggregators, they are producing value online, and so, and in some way, they are um, also, um, yeah, um, concentrating this value in few hands, and we should think about how to redistribute it. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, Sebastian. I mean, th this your position is very, very sympathetic, and I, I mean, it's, it's kind of just this. this a little bit geeky <laughs> position saying I just don't care about it. And I, I, I would like to, um, yes, support it. But on the other hand, I think um, you may be true, or it may be true that, that um, people should not care about, care too much about the specific forms of different licenses and how do they differ and, and, and so on. But I think the important um, or what was very important and what, what will also grow in importance um, in the l next years is that ordinary people have addressed these issues and that it has become a political discourse and a political conflict and no longer a discourse of experts. And it was uh, for a long time intellectual property issues were handled by intellectual property lawyers and uh, uh, intellectual property departments of big firms. And what we've seen in the last 15 years is that intellectual property has become an issue where everyday people um, have become interested in, have, um, have voiced their positions yeah. in it. And that has changed the political landscape. And therefore, I think it's very important not that people um, um, define specific rules within their project, how specific licenses should apply, but that people stay um, interested in these issues and mobilize around these issues and address policy makers about these issues because only then um, will we actually um, see political change on these issues and um, see political change that no longer exclusively um, um, cares for the interests of a very few and very select group of well-organized um, um, content providers and um, distributors of intellectual works. Jeanette. Um, I've been now thinking about what you all said and I would say the way I would look at this is probably from a European point of view versus an American point of view because for the European debate moral rights always have played a major role and the Americans have a much more market-based approach. It's sort of if something is protected by IPRs then it's tradable and you give it away and it is any, uh, like any other products that you have produced and that is definitely not the case in Europe. People claim moral rights in their fruit of labor. And that is not necessarily meant in a commercial sense. 
um, and that is perhaps it's a, uh, one can easiest use authors who write text as examples. They want to be quoted, and I certainly want to be quoted. When I find a text of mine on the internet that somebody else claims to have written, it makes me pretty angry. I'm willing to share my texts, but it's not sort of a, like a piece of software that can be used in another product without paying um, tribute to uh, my work I've put into that, and I still insist on that. That brings me to my next point. It could be that there is not only a difference between how Americans and Europeans and other cultures with different traditions look at this. There is probably also a difference between different genre, uh, genre of creative works. My feeling is only that I have evidence I, I could show for that that musicians might have a different, take a different approach to copyright than do photographers or authors. Photographers, um, that is my observation, are particularly aggressive about protecting their rights, various musicians might have a more relaxed stance when it comes to seeing their work uh, sampled because they often benefit also from that one. And the same is true for the industry of fashion. There is no uh, copyright that would regulate this market. And so far, the idea seems to be that most companies actually benefit from each other copying their colors, cuts, and I don't know what. It seems to drive the industry. So. I'm not sure that one can always explain this with uh, the mode of production. It might also be a matter of culture um, that sort of regulates these kinds of approaches. But there are certainly differences. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we diverge a lot from the uh, original issue here of com communities and their relation to uh, or the, the motivations that exist there, and but, but also the norms and regulations that uh, control the work or uh, the incentives in communities. But I think we, we covered a lot of ground, and probably this last round, um, Fortunately, on the one hand, was the most interesting one. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, unfortunately, because we run out of time and we have to finish here. But if there is anything else that you would like to discuss with the panel participants, I'm pretty certain that they'll stick around for a couple more <laughs> minutes or even longer if you, if you would like to approach them, approach them and have uh, um, questions for them. Um, thank you very much, everyone here on the panel. Thank you very much, everyone here in the audience. And Pavel, you have something I to I say? Ah, OK, OK. Do you need a microphone for that? Yes, OK. So. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for, the, uh, for this great and very interesting panel. Thank you very much again. And a round of applause, of course. Um, thank you, Matthias. Well, this brings to an end the 2012 Wikipedia Academy. Um, oh, that's very sad. Um, but um, there will be more. Next year, I'm pretty sure we're going to have another Wikipedia Academy because these uh, last uh, two days were tremendous. They were great. And they were great because of you, because everybody who participated in here. I think this was a, uh, a monument uh, to collaboration uh, and what collaboration can do. So let's do this again and do this continuously. Thank you very much, everybody, and see you around. Thank you. Thank you.